Hi, it's Dr. Maggie Perry with Tell Me What You're Proud Of. This is my second session with Catherine, where we are talking about intolerance of uncertainty. So in the last episode, um, we talked about intolerance of uncertainty in general, and she talked specifically about how the uncertainty in a number of different areas of her life um, can lead to worry and procrastination. Um, we specifically talked about work, but we can talk about a number of different areas of her life again. Today, we'll cover procrastination, perfectionism, and how that relates to her self-worth. So, Catherine, thank you so much for being on the show again. Sure thing. Thanks for having me. So, we left off talking about how uh, I think you were starting to talk about procrastination. Um, do you want to tell me a time in your life where you've um, procrastinated, how that relates to uncertainty? Yeah, I feel like, you know, procrastination is something that I didn't even I didn't even realize really tied into perfectionism until I started going to therapy, um, and I could think of countless examples of times that I procrastinate. I still procrastinate. I'm, it's just it's like um, second nature for me to put off something big because it feels too big in my mind. Um, I guess a good example would be um, years ago I was kind of at this crossroads in my career and I was trying to decide what to do next. And so I was exploring the idea of going to business school. Um, but the idea of studying for the exam and getting a really high score on it was so overwhelming in my mind. And so it was just so much that I always procrastinated actually studying. Um, and basically it became this thing where every time I sat down to study, it felt like it felt like the, like, it just, it felt like a huge, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Like in one particular moment um, of studying was going to decide the future of my career. Like it just felt so high stakes every time I sat down to study. Um, and so I just procrastinated the entire thing and I ended up not really doing it. And then I didn't, I ended up not going to business school at all. So um, I think that was probably a big example in my mind of a time that I like really procrastinated that I felt once I started therapy was like really tied into perfectionism. Yeah, really good awareness that in looking back on it, it was that every time you sat down to study, it felt like too high of stakes. So in hindsight, so I would put that in the camp of perfectionism, like thinking in any given moment that things have to go a certain way. And mistakes seem catastrophic. Uh, per perhaps you have to feel just right to get started on um, that studying. Do you remember having that feeling that it, you had to kind of be in the right mindset to get started on studying? And it was a mindset that was relatively elusive. Yes. Yeah, definitely. That I had to be like in the right mindset. And then if I wasn't in the right place, I wasn't even going to study well enough. And then therefore it was probably a like wasted study session um and yeah just the high stakes thing for sure like every time I sat down it felt like this like looming huge thing that like came over me um whereas I it's funny I've done like obviously therapy as well as reading on like flexible mindsets and understand in hindsight that if I had a slightly more flexible mindset I would have approached it more like this was an opportunity to learn something and like every piece of the studying process is, is a learning opportunity. And you're, of course, you're going to do some of the problems wrong in the process. That's, that's the entire um, experience of learning the, the, um, the games of the test and things like that. But for me at the time, it was just very overwhelming. Yeah. And it can be really hard to, to shift into that this is a learning opportunity mindset and particularly maintain it when you're feeling a lot of anxiety or whatever you're up against is actually high stakes. So is that um, a mindset that you've been able to embody um, in the current tense, like in the present tense? Like right now? Yeah. Um, yes, sometimes. I, I would say I have to like continually remind myself that. I think that I, um, I can get in that mindset, which feels good and it feels like growth. It's just like I'm reminding myself when I feel those waves of like perfectionism and like um, if I don't do something correct in any one given moment, 
um, that it's actually a learning opportunity. It's, it's not second nature for me to think this is a learning opportunity and this is fun and like this is cool to explore, but I can remind myself it and I can feel a sense of um, calm in remembering that and start to approach things like a little more um, playfully, I guess. Yeah. And the other thing that I can imagine that you and other people that go through what you're describing experience is regret over maybe anxiety that they've had in the past or procrastination that's led to actual consequences for their life. Do you feel regret when you think back on not applying to, to business school and not being able to study? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't, I don't feel regret on not going to business school. I don't think in the present day it would be a good decision for me for a ton of different reasons. Um, I do regret, I guess, not having the choice. Like, it's not really like I ever had a choice to go or not go because I never got through the studying um, process. So, you know, so simultaneously, though, part of me thinks that my mindset is was especially so perfectionist that if I had had the choice, I would have just gone regardless because that's what people in my career do. You go to a top business school and like that's the next step. And I really actually don't think that would have been the right step for me. So I can spin it to myself now as like a sort of positive narrative. Um, but I do think that it would have been nice to have the choice, even if I ultimately didn't go. Yeah, that's a really um, compassionate and flexible perspective, even if you're not uh, working to bring up that kind of flexible perspective um, because it doesn't, I, th I think sometimes when per perfectionistic thinking is maintained, um, it's not just the procrastination that leads to consequences in someone's life, but then it's regret and self-criticism that makes it hard to move on. Um, so I really appreciate what you're saying that you did have this episode where perfectionism got in the way and led to procrastination. And also you've been able to take a different route and then appreciate that growth within yourself. Um, for those that are um, maybe don't see the connection as well, um, many people think that they're not perfectionistic because they frequently are unable to do whatever they're perfectionistically uh, perfectionistic about. But perfectionism and procrastination are two sides of the same coin. And it's actually more likely that someone that's perfectionistic doesn't engage in the behavior, or if they engage in the behavior, it they have to do it so perfectly that it ends up taking too long. They have diminishing returns. It gets in the way of life in some other kind of way. Um, so that's what would, those are markers and hallmarks of clinical perfectionism. If either you don't even attempt things that you value or when you do things that you value, you do them so perfectly, you attempt to do them so perfectly that they have a negative consequence for your life in some other area. Um, does that make sense to you, Catherine? It does, and it's funny because I didn't, I didn't even realize, I, I didn't realize until I started therapy, the procrastination piece and how it ties into perfectionism. I think growing up, I assumed I had perfectionist tendencies because I did really well in school and I studied really hard and I was like fairly neurotic about how I did on tests and things like that. So I kind of understood that I had some component of perfectionism in that realm of my life, but I procrastinate literally everything. I mean, even to this day, I am always the last person to arrive at an event. I'm always like, I'm, I'm regularly late for stuff. And, um, it's funny, like hearing you say that was just jogging through my mind, um, the like routine I go through to get ready to get out the door and like part of uh, putting that off because I like apply my makeup in a certain order and things like that. Um, and so I just think that the procrastination piece um, of perfectionism is actually pretty, um, pretty, what's the word, uh, applicable in many aspects of my life. Um, that I didn't really realize until I started understanding more about psychology. Yeah, and some other examples before we come back to you would be in the case of contamination fear that um, people assume that people with contamination OCD or contamination perfectionism um, are always have a, a tidy and clean home. But in fact, sometimes the perfectionism is so intense that it, it's difficult to um, clean 
in a, in a reasonable kind of way and someone's home actually becomes dirtier. Um, other examples, so we're already using the work example that you would assume in academics or in work that a perfectionist would have everything done um, really well done and totally on time and be really um, rigid about meeting those deadlines. But somebody that's suffering from perfectionism in a clinical way is actually more likely to be avoiding and not meeting their obligations. Or, and again, or if they start to try to not avoid, then it's really difficult to not get stuck in what they're doing. Um, so as we think about how to shift away from perfectionistic thinking, um, the first step is noticing that it's happening. And so Catherine, you did a great job just now noticing that even something like putting on makeup in a certain way is also a perfectionistic tendency. Um, so the first step is to notice. And then the next step is to um, work to have a more flexible attitude so that you can have more flexible behavior. So in your case, what would you, how would you need to shift your attitude or your mindset to make it so that you're more likely to be on time for events? Um, that's a loaded question because I am so often late for things. Um, I think, I think trying to think through ways that, um, I don't need to look a certain way when I go out the door, but it, it, it it's interesting because it's not really even how I look. It's more like the process. Mm -hmm. That you want to feel a certain way. Yeah, like I like to do, I like to do the process in a, in a certain order. Um, and it really does like drive me nuts when I only get like a certain way through the process. And my boyfriend is like, come on, we have to go. And I'm like, nope, but I'm on step four. And I have like six more steps to go through to finish the getting ready process. When you say it drives you nuts, can you be more specific about how that feels? Like what you think and feel if you are, um, if your whole routine is disrupted? It feels incomplete. Um, like it feels like I had a process set out and I didn't finish it. It feels like I didn't accomplish something, you know, like a really micro example. So it sounds like it's, um, it's uncomfortable for its own sake. It's not necessarily like I'm going to be judged by how I look or my self-worth is tied to a, a certain kind of outcome of how I look or, or what I'm, how I'm behaving. It's more that this just feels uncomfortable for its own sake and it's aversive to you for its own sake. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, thank you for using that example. That's completely an area of perfectionism. That's very common. Um, how does it feel to recognize that that's happening for you? It's interesting because I've actually never really thought about it until this call right now. <laughs> And, and what would it mean for your life to try to be more flexible around your, that routine? Um, honestly, it would actually probably improve a lot of relationships because I would be more likely to show up on time to things, I think. And I am well known as the friend who does not show up on time. My friends have made an entire game, like an over-under game around the time that Catherine shows up to events. Got it. And you can, even though that game might seem funny and silly, you can actually see that it probably has an impact on your relationships. Yeah. People are definitely irritated when I show up late. <laughs> okay. So is that, does that make it worth it to be uncomfortable and to tolerate, to like let yourself habituate to stopping your routine midway um, and then letting yourself be uncomfortable about what you didn't do? Yeah, I think that that would be definitely a worthy thing for me to try to adapt to, for sure. Okay, so I think the best way, well, I'm interested in your opinion on this, but what comes to mind for me would be the best way to um, start to do exposure in this area would be to set a time on it. So rather than trying to get through all your steps faster, you want to actually do them in the same order as usual, but set a time for when it has to be done so that you um, have to live with the possibility that you miss some of the steps. Mm, okay. Okay. Because sometimes when people try to do exposure around this, they just try to do everything faster. I see. Yeah. Okay. And then that will eventually backfire. Right. Um, this would be 
with cleaning or with academic or work um, situations, sometimes people recognize that they're perfectionistic and then they say like, okay, I'm just going to do everything really fast, but the same kind of way. And then that just gets very stressful. And then they stop trying to, to, um, it, it like creates the same pattern of procrastination because it's so hard to maintain the sta- the standard of excellence. And w- one other really important point here is that in challenging clinical perfectionism, we're not um, saying that you have to drop your standards. So I still want you to excel and have high standards. We're saying clinical perfectionism is a problem of strategy, not outcome. So the de- desire for a certain outcome is totally fine. It's just the strategy of trying to do it perfectly, having mistakes be catastrophic, w- working at something until it feels a certain way, only working on something if it feels a certain way, um, um, focusing on how high the stakes would be if things didn't go a certain way. Um, all of those are examples of thinking that contributes to perfectionism that makes it less likely for you to achieve your goals. That makes complete sense. Yeah. Um, so the other concept that's, I think, relevant here in terms of overcoming procrastination, in in addition to kind of having a different mindset where rather than doing something perfectly, you're trying to do things flexibly um, and trying to work on flexibility as um, a goal in its own sake. So everything is a learning opportunity. It's okay for things to be imperfect. If I'm doing something and it feels uncomfortable, I'm actually building like a flexible psychological muscle and it's good for its own sake. Um, Those are some parts of the mindset. The other thing is to prepare for the urge to procrastinate. And in that case, I think you want to think about anticipatory anxiety. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's the anxiety you feel before you start something. And if you have years of procrastination on something, of course, you're going to have anticipatory anxiety before you get started because you're used to getting in a spot where you have to do things perfectly or you're going to face a lot of self-criticism. And that's aversive because it's painful. So the important thing to recognize with anticipatory anxiety is that it's a feeling, not a fact or prediction. And it's more of an indication of what's happened in the past than what's going to happen in the future. So if you notice that you have anticipatory anxiety, you just want to allow those sensations to be in your body, label it and keep moving forward. And if you can get in the habit of tolerating anticipatory anxiety and then going into the situation and approaching it flexibly, with willingness to make mistakes and willingness to be imperfect, over time, you're going to have less anticipatory anxiety because you can trust yourself that you can get started. Does that make sense? That makes complete sense. And I think that I um, definitely historically and even still struggle to the sense, uh, to some degree, around the sense that if I have the feeling, it will become the outcome. So like the, the sense that like anticipatory anxiety is almost like predicting what's going to happen. So I think that's something that I'm like, I definitely have learned through being in therapy, but it's still something that I have to keep working on because it's, it's like, it is definitely second nature for me to have a feeling and assume that like an outcome is going to come out of it. Yes. I think that's a very common experience. Um, and I think some people get frustrated when they feel anticipatory anxiety, um, especially if it's something that they want to be excited for. So it's something that you want to work on or you feel excited for, but you, um, so for instance, if you're getting dinner with friends and you're excited for that event, but you have anticipatory anxiety about how long it's going to take you to get ready, um, that can be, um, feel daunting, um, because it, and it feels like it might ruin the event. And so just the framework you want to approach that with is it's okay to feel anticipatory anxiety. This is, uh, again, an indication of my past, not what's happening in the future. And if I practice having compassion and flexibility as I approach my anticipatory anxiety, I won't always have that same feeling as I'm getting ready for work or for the social event or whatever I'm planning to do. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, So the other theme is really how self-worth can be tied to um, perfectionism. So we're we're kind of talking about it where there's no feared consequence. It's just the feeling itself that leads to perfectionism. Do you have times when it feels like your self-worth is on the line and um, you want to do things perfectly because you'd otherwise feel worthless? 
Definitely. I would say, um, you know, the GMAT example is one or any real um, business example really comes up often. Like any, anything work related, I feel like there's always a self-worth piece tied to it because so much of my identity has been around um, being a good student, being a good employee, being a good um, like business person in many ways. And so it does feel like there's a self-worth piece um, related to some anxiety and procrastination in, in that realm of life, at least. And so how do you, re- good awareness there, how, ca- how do you relate to that um, fear that if things don't go a certain way, then that means that you're not worthy or you're not good enough? Um, I think, I don't, I don't know if this is like, the right answer, but I think something I've been working on is again around the flexible mindset around like, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is um, if you don't take any risks, like you don't have the chance for reward, you don't have the chance for learning. So framing things in my mind that are business related, especially if they're things I haven't done before, or if it's like, you know, the first time I'm taking on and leading a really big project. Um, trying to be a little more like, yeah, well, the alternative is you just wouldn't do this. And the reality is that um, this is something you want to do and this is something you've been working towards and you you won't have the opportunity of succeeding at it if you don't just start. Um, does that sort of get to what you're asking? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really flexible and compassionate mindset also. It's hard um, to get there, but that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Yeah, I think the other place where people get tied up is thinking, well, you know, my team really is counting on me for this big project. So it really does, it really does matter that I succeed. And life feels a little bit conditional in that sense. And like the reason that I feel like I'm not good enough if I don't succeed is because people really are going to have a reaction to me. And the way that I would work with that is that's actually true. Uh, Most aspects of life are pretty conditional and people, other people have expectations for how you are going to show up. Um, but that doesn't have to have anything to do with your worthiness. If you don't, um, if you don't reinforce it. So if you have the sense that you're not good enough and you work extra hard, you get reassurance, um, you beat yourself up, all of these things are going to make you feel less good about yourself where if you just say kind of like what you're saying that I'm doing something challenging and uncertain, of course, I'm going to have anticipatory anxiety and I'm not going to do everything perfectly and that's okay. I'm just going to keep working at it and ask for help when I need it. Um, The reality is that if you have the skills and the um, aptitude to get to where you are. And if other people see potential in you and are saying like, we're going to give you this responsibility and see what happens. Then if you keep showing up in a non-perfectionistic kind of way, you're likely going to learn and then be able to succeed at that task. And that whole process actually has nothing to do with like your worthiness as a human. So it's only that concept only gets tied into how you relate to the, to other people. If you yourself are like trying to protect against the feeling of worthlessness. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that that is also something that I, I've now, like, I guess when I started uh, therapy, that would have been a really, really hard mindset for me to adjust to like everything work related felt like I was under a deadline I had to do well, I was going to let people down. If I didn't do well, I was going to let myself down. Um, but I have noticed since we began talking about um, the kind of uh, framework that you're discussing of being like, this is a learning opportunity. These people believed that I have the skills to do this. And so like, maybe this was my first time doing it, but um, I, this is an opportunity for me to learn. And the people around me believe that I'm qualified to be in this position. Um, I would say since I started to flip to that mindset, probably, I guess, a couple of years ago, um, it's still something I work on, but I have seen that that is true. Like I have seen the outcome of being like, 
oh, I wasn't totally prepared for this project because it was the first time I had done it. Um, but I approached it with a little bit more of a flexible mindset. And um, I got, I, like I still, the, the launch went off successfully. I still hit my metrics. Um, maybe some things along the way weren't entirely perfect, but like I more than exceeded the goal I was looking for. And um, I learned, I learned in the process. So I feel like I have been able to not only start to adopt that mindset, but see how it has positive outcomes associated with it, which is then reinforcing to keep trying to use that mindset when my, when my like nature, like natural psychology would like not want me to. Great. Yeah, I'm happy to hear all of that progress. Um, that sounds like a really good mindset. Um, so I'm aware of our time for today. We'll stop here, but we'll come back to um, an ongoing discussion of intolerance of uncertainty. Thanks so much, Catherine. Thank you.